And the next item of business is a statement by Rosanna Cunningham on Scotland's plans to tackle climate change and reduce emissions. And the Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of her statement. So if any member wishes to ask a question, I would encourage you to press your request to speak button now. And I call on Rosanna Cunningham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. In 2009, the Scottish Parliament unanimously passed the most ambitious climate change legislation anywhere in the world. And eight years later, I'm laying the Scottish Government's third report on policies and proposals for meeting the statutory emissions reductions targets from 2018 to 2032, our climate change plan. A little late, thanks to last week's weather, uh, but perhaps fittingly so, given that for Scotland, the reality of climate change will mean increasingly frequent severe weather events. This plan has been prepared in accordance with sections 35 and 36 of the Climate Change Scotland Act 2009. In January 2017, I laid before Parliament a draft version of the plan, and I'm grateful for the scrutiny of four parliamentary committees. In considering the recommendations made, Advice was received from the Committee on Climate Change, along with feedback from a wide range of stakeholders with interests across the entire range of society and the economy. I wish to formally thank everyone involved in the development of this final plan. We have responded with changes which I believe result in a better plan, more balanced, more ambitious, and more achievable. The final version of the plan is very different to the draft. It addresses members' concerns and it presents what is undeniably a complex set of issues, policies and proposals in a more accessible way. In short, we listened and we have produced a climate change plan fit for the future and for a growing, uh, for a growing economy. So what is in the plan? It sets out a vision of Scotland's society for 2032 and the policies that will get us there. Of course, in our programme for government in September last year, we also announced significant policy changes affecting greenhouse gas emissions, and these have been embedded uh, within the plan. The plan is broken down into sectors of the economy and sets out the contribution of each. Scotland's electricity system has been our great success to date and shines a light on the path for other sectors to follow. Already largely decarbonised, our electricity system will be increasingly important as a power source for heat and transport. With our new energy strategy for Scotland, published in December, we are committed to delivering 50% of all Scotland's energy needs from renewables by 2030. By 2032, we will also have set the scene for the deployment of carbon capture and storage technologies. Although the plan does not rely on CCS to deliver our emission reduction ambitions, our support for the ACORN site at St Fargus, which will demonstrate how our North Sea infrastructure can be reconfigured and reused to remove and store carbon from the atmosphere shows our determination to do even more in the energy sector. In transport, we will transform the way we travel. Scotland will be a safer and friendlier place for pedestrians and cyclists, and our plans for electric vehicles and infrastructure mean that we'll phase out the need to buy petrol and diesel cars and vans a full eight years ahead of the UK. We will introduce low emission zones to Scotland's largest cities, improving the quality of our air, and we will take significant strides towards greener buses, HGVs, and ferries. Our buildings will be insulated to the maximum appropriate level and will increasingly be heated and cooled by low carbon technologies, which will benefit consumers through lower heating bills, helping combat fuel poverty. An entire low carbon services sector will grow around the half billion pounds we're investing in Scotland's energy efficiency programme. Over the lifetime of this plan, we will end the landfilling of biodegradable municipal waste, reduce food waste, and both industry and consumers will benefit from a more circular economy. By 2032, we will have transformed our landscape. New forests will be planted in the right places and more of our peatlands will be restored to health, storing greater amounts of carbon, increasing biodiversity, and making for healthier ecosystems. By 2032, we will see the realization of our ambition for Scotland to be among the lowest carbon and most efficient food producers in the world. 
Scotland will be a world-class producer of high-quality food with growing numbers of farmers and crofters moving to low-carbon farming practices. This will not only achieve greenhouse gas emissions reductions, but will generate improvements in animal health and welfare, provide cleaner water and air, and crucially save farmers money. Scotland's industrial sector will be more energy efficient, more productive, and will be using more innovative technologies, presenting significant economic and competitive opportunities. This will be supported by our low carbon infrastructure transition program, through which we'll provide 60 million pounds of new investment to maximize Scotland's enormous potential in the low carbon sector. The significant decarbonization needed in industry depends of course on our continuing access to the EU emissions trading system. Sadly, the UK government's continued lack of clarity here is risking investment and growth in our economy. As it prepares to remove Scotland from the EU, it is imperative for the UK government to reassure industry that the level playing field provided by the ETS across Europe will be maintained for Scottish businesses. Communities naturally have a critical role to play and this plan recognises that. I'm particularly proud of the support we've provided through our Climate Challenge Fund, which has helped community-led organisations tackle climate change by running projects that reduce local carbon emissions. Businesses also have a crucial role to play. Moving early to invest in energy efficiency will protect them against rises in fuel prices, and shifting operations to a low carbon footing will meet the expectations of an increasingly climate aware consumer base. With an estimated $23 trillion worth of climate friendly investment opportunities uh, by 2030, the direction of travel is self-evident and our message to business is simple. We will do all we can to provide you with the certainty and stability you need to invest and grow in the low carbon economy. With last week's announcement of the implementation plan for the Scottish National Investment Bank, there is reassurance that we will provide flexible finance for our companies to innovate and grasp the opportunities of the low carbon economy. The transition to an environmentally and social, socially sustainable economy may look daunting. To make sure it will be a positive experience for workers, communities and businesses, we are working towards the establishment of a Just Transition Commission uh, later this year. The Commission will provide advice to ministers on how to proceed while helping to tackle inequality and poverty and promote, promote a fair and inclusive jobs market. Scotland has a particular responsibility to deal with climate change. Arguably, it was a Scot, Greenock's own James Watt, who ushered in the Industrial Revolution and the burning of fossil fuels on a massive scale. And it's right that we demonstrate leadership in dealing with the causes and effects of climate change. At the global climate negotiations in Bonn last year, the First Minister said that our ambitions must live up to the scale of the challenge and our actions must live up to our ambitions. This government is already making a difference abroad. We're working with international partners to build and maintain the momentum for action. And with our Climate Justice Fund, we're supporting some of the poorest and most vulnerable communities in Africa. But it's our actions here at home that will give us the credibility to lead others. And with this plan, we set out our ambitions for Scotland. These ambitions will be difficult to achieve. There will be bumps on the road ahead. But we choose this road willingly, meeting the challenge head on with our stringent and demanding annual targets and our commitment not to purchase carbon allowances in the international markets. Soon, we'll introduce a new climate change bill to raise our ambition even higher. We're not taking any easy options because this government believes that we have a moral obligation to act. We are confident that Scotland's unique gifts, plentiful renewable energy resources, a strong legacy of innovation and the ingenuity of the people of Scotland will enable us to realise the opportunities that lie ahead. My cabinet colleagues and I are dedicated to delivering the vision set out in this climate change plan to tackle one of the world's most challenging issues. And I commend this climate change plan to members. Thank you, Colin. John Scott to be followed by Claudia Beamish. John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and declaring an interest as a farmer 
The climate change plan published by the Scottish Government yesterday lacks specificity and ambition across most sectors. Like others, we are frustrated that the Scottish Government has ignored many suggestions made by MSPs and parliamentary committees to improve the climate change plan, and we are disappointed to see little has changed from the draft plan published a year ago. So we would like to see the Scottish Government provide more clarity in the actions they will take and the policies they will introduce to tackle climate change, particularly in the transport sector. Specifically, last week, we saw in the latest transport statistics that bus passenger numbers in Scotland have fallen by 10% over the last five years, and only 31% of journeys to work were by public or active travel in 2016, the same as in 2006. In addition, and more worryingly, at the current rate of progress, it will take around 239 years to reach the government's target of 10% of journeys to be made by bike. So, presiding officer, how can the cabinet secretary expect there to be a modal shift away from petrol and diesel cars to public and active travel when under her government's stewardship we have seen such little progress thus far and also when will we see transport emissions start falling given the trends we see in car usage and active travel cabinet secretary well can i just say to john scott that i, I thought his opening comments were utterly absurd um, uh, we are one of the most ambitious governments in the world when it comes to tackling climate change and I don't think he would get much argument uh, about that from uh, many of our international partners. So uh, to suggest that there is a lack of ambition is, uh, is, is, quite, is quite ridiculous. There's, there's been a great deal has in fact changed between the draft plan and now, not least of which there's been uh, updated greenhouse gas emissions stats to be uh, brought on board. There's been programme for government uh, um, uh, proposals to be uh, to be wrapped into the plan uh, and indeed there's been various recommendations uh, many of which have been included uh, in the final final plan uh, in respect of uh, transport uh, the truth is that transport emissions will have been reduced by 37 percent over the lifetime of the plan which is the greatest reduction in absolute terms of any sector uh, we're more ambitious in our plans for transport in scotland than uh, the Tory-run UK government is at Westminster uh, and I doubt whether anybody looking at our proposals in respect of active travel, uh, in respect of low emission zones, in respect of uh, uh, the move towards uh, uh, low emission uh, vehicles uh, could possibly come to the same conclusion uh, that he has come to and uh, I hope that uh, this change of tone from uh, someone who is uh, normally a rather more reasonable individual uh, is not indicative uh, of, uh, of a wider uh, move uh, across the Conservative Party in this chamber. Claudia Beamish to be followed by Mark Ruskell. <clears throat> Thank you, Presiding Officer. The stark difference between the plan and the government's earlier draft is puzzling, in some areas swinging quite dramatically from unrealistic to unambitious, or, in the Cabinet Secretary's own words, more achievable. Was this really the aim? The, land, the, the windfall from the land use sector and the new effort in transport with fossil fuel phase out is to be welcomed and is favorable in terms of emissions. But it is so disappointing to see that used in my understanding of the final plan to reduce effort in other sectors. The plan is already based on the outdated ambition of the 2009 Act and Scottish Labour has urged the government to consider a 77% target for emissions reductions by 2030. Can the Cabinet Secretary explain why most of the sectoral targets have changed so dramatically for the worse? I must focus on agriculture, which has been allowed to lag behind so sizably that with policies all seem to be now about encouragement. Does the Cabinet Secretary feel the criticisms of this section of the earlier draft have been sufficiently addressed? Cabinet Secretary. Well, there have been some significant changes uh, since the draft uh, plan was published, uh, not least of which in uh, uh, scientific measurement. Um, there have been uh, a new set of greenhouse gas emissions uh, uh, stats, and uh, you'll have uh, no doubt heard my previous answer about some of the other things that have changed. So the, the, the draft plan and the final plan um, were never going to look uh, exactly the same. Um, yes, we have taken uh, the opportunity that some changes uh, have, uh, have, have given us to make some adjustments to the draft plan. I mean, one of the adjustments, uh, I suppose, uh, um, that the member might be 
uh, concerned about in terms of uh, reining back uh, was, for example, um, on the uh, ambition on heat, which was uh, the, the uh, um, proposal in the draft plan um, was criticised by uh, the Climate Change Committee, who considered that not to be credible. So we have taken the opportunity to, uh, to look again at that uh, and use uh, the uh, capacity that we now had across the system uh, to produce something which is uh, considerably uh, more achievable. Now, the member uh, refers to agriculture over the lifetime of a plan. Uh, the emissions from the agriculture sector will fall by uh, 9%. Uh, but I would, I would remind the member that it is almost impossible uh, to conduct agriculture without a certain level of emissions. This is not an area of endeavour that can be uh, emissions free. So we have to work as well as we can with farmers in order to get them to move uh, to uh, better practices. Uh, we have programs in place that are allowing us uh, to do that. 2015 stats show that agriculture emissions are down by more than 25% from baseline levels. So we are making changes there and we will continue to do so. Mark Ruskell to be followed by Graham D. Thank you. And can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for advanced copy of the statement? The statement talks about a final plan that's apparently more ambitious and very different to the draft. I mean, it certainly does appear, Cabinet Secretary, that, that this plan is very different to the draft, because if you add up all the Scottish Government policies in the final plan, it results in emissions reductions one million tonnes less than in the draft. Why is this the case? And does the Scottish Government still believe that we'll be driving around in our cars a third more by 2030? Cabinet Secretary. I don't want to just repeat some of the things that I've already said in response to both John Scott and Claudia Beamish. The member will have heard me talking about uh, some of the reasons why the changes uh, between uh, uh, the, the draft uh, and the final plan and many of the things that have happened uh, in, in, uh, uh, in between that. Um, I think that uh, the thing that has to be uh, said about the transport uh, is that the, the, uh, um, the projections that are in uh, the plan are uh, on the assumption that there is no change, but there is, of course, going to be change. Uh, and, that's, uh, uh, and that's something, and one of the areas in which I believe this government uh, is, is going to deliver, um, to deliver the most. So uh, I don't uh, see why uh, members uh, should feel pessimistic about that. I think... Uh, I think we're doing, uh, in, uh, uh, doing very well, and certainly in comparison to the Westminster government, I think we're going to uh, be doing uh, uh, far, 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 far better. So um, I, I hope that the member uh, will take that on board. And uh, uh, as I've indicated, some of the things that I've already said in response to the previous, previous two questions apply equally to his own question. I simply don't want to repeat myself, presiding officer. Graham Dade, sorry, Graham Dade to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, environmental campaigners have called on the Scottish Government to do much more to cut emissions from domestic properties. Uh, given 80% of Scotland's homes are heated by gas, could the Cabinet Secretary outline what, in practice, uh, that would mean for public expenditure, the supply chain, and indeed householders themselves? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, it would be... Uh, um uh, quite difficult and uh, in some uh, areas incredibly disruptive that I, I made reference in an earlier answer uh, to the fact that the independent advisor of the Committee on Climate Change has already advised that the, the transition to near zero emissions buildings is likely to take decades and we should be realistic about the contribution this sector can make to targets in 2032 and they criticised the original uh, ambition in, in, the, uh, in the draft plan. A key consideration that we have to take on board is the, is the risk of stranded assets, which is uh, uh, where a less disruptive or competitive solution may be anticipated. We don't want to find ourselves going down one direction and then discovering that there's a, a better direction uh, we might have taken. So we're going to focus on policies that are relatively low cost and provide relatively large benefits and that helps optimize investment decisions in the near term but of course in the meantime there's also innovation uh, which will help in the longer term. We'll be working with partners in the UK government to determine the best route to decarbonize the natural gas network uh, for example through the injection of hydrogen. 
So we plan for a future of heat supply. We're continuing to deliver real measures on the ground. We're on track to deliver the 2016 programme for government commitment to make half a billion pounds available for fuel poverty and energy efficiency over the four years to 2021. And arguably, some of the original proposals that were in uh, the draft plan may have exacerbated the situation in respect of fuel poverty rather than solve it. Liam MacArthur to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, President Officer. As Graham Day said, uh, environmental groups have expressed concerns about um, some of the changes from the draft to this final plan. As the existing Homes Alliance says, Scotland shivers, government cuts warm homes ambition. It's right that the Cabinet Secretary takes uh, on board points made about deliverability of targets, but can she really justify a collapse in the target for low carbon domestic heat from 80% in the draft to 35% in the final plan? And what will this do to address uh, issues around fuel poverty, which, as latest figures suggest, again is highest in my own constituency. Absolutely. Well, if I can just uh, reiterate a little what I've already uh, indicated, um, the criticisms, uh, and I understand why that is, they've just looked at a figure in the draft plan, looked at a figure in the final plan, um, and perhaps not thought through carefully why there is that difference. I go back again to say that the Committee on Climate Change advised that the draft plan's targets were not credible. And, you know, we have to look as a government as to what is actually doable. And it is interesting that when I'm asked questions about various aspects, what I don't get are any actual suggested solutions. And I don't want to make that sound that a criticism of Liam MacArthur. Um, I think that, uh, uh, I mean, there are real issues uh, about making this uh, practicable and doable. And we are working towards targets. Uh, working towards them uh, would have involved, the original targets would have involved making early decisions on low carbon technologies with the risk of backing the wrong solution. And that would have ended up costing us considerably more and us can mean the consumer. So Claudia Beamish and everybody else can shake their head. What would they propose we do? Go into everybody's homes within the next five years and rip out all the gas central heating? Uh, members in this chamber thinking about their own central heating uh, proposals? planning on doing that so I think there is some real issues about practicality disruption and our ability to ensure that as we move forward that people don't end up in a worse situation than they are now. Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Finlay Carson. Uh, can I thank the Scottish Government for the support given to the ACORN project uh, in my constituency. It's uh, one of a series of uh, initiatives that uh, underpin Scotland's international reputation. How are other countries uh, catching up with us? How are they using our example uh, in their own domains? In particular, I was thinking of nations like Sweden. Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, we're frequently compared to Sweden. And despite the, uh, um, the response of some members here today, the traditional way of describing our positioning is that we are third uh, behind Sweden and Finland in the world for tackling uh, climate change. Now, um, there are one or two things, I think, about Sweden that need to be said. Um, first of all, Sweden doesn't include the, uh, the land use sector in, uh, in their uh, emissions. They don't include aviation and maritime emissions, unlike uh, Scotland. Um, they have no annual targets the way Scotland does. And they reserve the right to buy international carbon credits to make up 15% of their emissions. So we're not comparing like with like. And on one view, we are doing considerably better. So if objectively some people are saying that we are third behind Sweden and Finland, I'm making a point here that when we compare ourselves to Sweden, actually, in my view, we are doing better. So perhaps we could claim to be the best in the world. Finley Carson to be followed by Ivan McKee. Uh, the ambition for decarbonising Scotland's buildings has been dramatically reined in to 35%, even though the Committee on Climate Change suggested a target of 50%. The CCC said achieving ambition levels, ambitious levels of low carbon heating requires immediate action rather than waiting until 2025 and describes low regret actions that can be taken now, such as new buildings, heat pumps for off-grid gas homes, uh, greater use of biomass and new district uh, heating systems. So why does the plan say that low and no regret options for low carbon heat will still be left till after 2025? 
If these options for decarbonisation are low or low regret, no or low regret, why is action not being taken in the short term? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we are, of course. I mean, there's an enormous uh, uh, um, energy efficiency programme uh, funded to the tune of half a billion pounds uh, about to start in Scotland. I'm not quite sure what the member uh, thinks that's about, but I can tell you it's about this uh, particularly. Now, the Climate Change uh, uh, Committee uh, did advise us, as I've said on a number of occasions here this afternoon, that our original targets were not credible. And, and what we're now uh, proposing uh, is uh, both a balance between domestic and non-domestic. Uh, so a balance, in my view, of ambition with realism. We're setting low carbon heat targets of 35% for the domestic sector and 70% for the non-domestic sector. And that's in line with the, carbon, uh, uh, with the Climate Change Committee's assessment of what can be achieved. And activity until 2025, presiding officer, will focus on low regrets heat decarbonisation technologies, such as the uptake of renewable heat technologies in individual buildings off the gas grid and supporting low carbon district heating in appropriate areas. And I think that what we've proposed here is in line with the Committee on Climate Change advice uh, as a way forward. Um, and I, I reiterate that some of what could be suggested as being presented as a possibility would be a massive disruption uh, within Scotland and almost impossible practically to achieve. Ivan McKee to be followed by David Stewart. Uh, thank you. Can the um, Cabinet Secretary explain how the government plans to engage with new technologies to support the electrification of the transport sector? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we've really already got innovation at the heart of uh, the Scottish Government's low carbon transport policies. We're already supporting international firsts on the use and production of hydrogen for transport, including the Surf and Turf Initiative in Orkney, in uh, Liam MacArthur's constituency. Um, the PFG commitment to end the need for new petrol and diesel by 2032 is another signal that Scotland can be at the forefront of innovation and new technologies. And in September 2017, we launched a £60 million uh, low carbon innovation fund. And that aimed to support a range of new low carbon projects in Scotland, including our ambitions on low emissions vehicles. Uh, we also continue to work closely with the energy sector and regulators to support future investment and uh, innovation in areas such as smart grids, vehicle charging and refueling. And we're also tracking emerging technologies and business models to better understand their potential impacts and the support we can provide. Uh, I think there are further announcements uh, coming in respect of that, uh, presiding officer, so uh, perhaps I should leave that to my ministerial colleagues. David Stewart, to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. The Cabinet Secretary in her statement rightly said that significant decarbonisation in the industrial sector depends on continuing access to the EU emissions trading scheme. What assessment has the Cabinet Secretary made of the effect of withdrawal from the EU emissions trading scheme will have on the climate change plan? And has any work been carried out with the other nation states in the UK to develop a UK ETS? Well, I think it's fair to say um, that the EU ETS is the single most important policy instrument in driving down industrial emissions. And we do continue to call for clarity from the UK government as it prepares to leave the EU. Um, I may say that until last week, there had been really almost no response whatsoever uh, to that. Um, there is now some indication that some thought is finally being given uh, as to what the future might hold uh, in terms of uh, an emissions trading system, although we are completely unclear as to how that might look. So we've had to operate in terms of this climate change plan on the basis of the current scenario, which is a fully functioning ETS across the whole of Europe. Um, clearly, if, that doesn't, if we do not end up having, uh, uh, continuing to be part of that, um, then there will be some significant impact, I think, that will require at that point to be, uh, to be measured. Um, but it is, a, it is a difficult position, and ironically, it is one framework where I think everybody agrees that we need something in its place if we are not to join uh, or be, continue to be part of the EU ETS. But thus far, there seems to be precious little um, serious engagement and thought given from Westminster. Fulton McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome this plan and that Coatbridge has been earmarked 
uh, as a targeted area for low emission zones, uh, given high levels of pollution and social deprivation. But I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary could explain this concept of carbon leakage and its potential implications for the Scottish economy in the context of Brexit. Cabinet Secretary. Um, Presiding officer, it's a, a kind of tricky concept. It occurs, carbon leakage is what occurs when industry simply relocates to jurisdictions with lower decarbonisation emissions ambitions, uh, and it results in displacement of emissions rather than any overall reduction. Um, were businesses to move their operations, it would also have a detrimental effect on our economy. Uh, and climate policies that introduce costs above those of other countries could negatively impact on competitiveness of businesses with a lot of international trade. And at the extreme, this could result in relocating to countries where there are uh, more lax climate policies, uh, leading to almost the opposite effect to the one that we're trying uh, to reach. There would also be a risk of increased import dependence to source the inputs and intermediate products for manufacturing processes. And these are already live issues being considered by the business community given the uncertainties associated uh, with Brexit. Now, we're currently a participant, as I indicated, uh, in the EU emissions trading system, which does put a price on industrial emissions and energy production throughout the whole of Europe and allows that uh, level playing field. And we remain of the view that continued participation in the ETS uh, and UK regulatory frameworks would ensure that industry retains that wide level playing field which protects against carbon leakage from competitors out with the EU. Um, so we do continue to press the UKG for clarity on its plans for emissions trading as it prepares to leave the EU. What we don't want to end up in a situation is uh, by actions uh, within, the e uh, within the UK and Scotland, all we do is export carbon emissions. Thank you and uh, apologies to the remaining two members as we've run out of time tight afternoon. That concludes this item of business. We now move on to a statement by Shirley Ann Somerville on widening access to higher education. And the Minister will also take questions at the end of this statement, so I would encourage all members who wish to ask a question to press their request to speak buttons now.